الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام وسيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن استنى بسنته بإحسان إلى يوم الدين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنحتدي لولا أن هدانا الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I would like to welcome you all to another session from commentary on the Arba'un or the Arba'in of Imam al-Nawi رحمه الله and الحمد لله we are now on hadith number 18 and this is on Taqwa. Okay, and let us begin the recitation of the hadith. An Abi Dharrin Jundub ibn Junada wa Abi Abdir Rahman Mu'ad ibn Jabal radi anhuma an Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam akal ittakillah haytuma kunt wa atbi isayyat al-hasanata tamhuha wa khalikin nasa bi khulukin hasan. Ra'at Tirmidiyu wa qal hadithun hasan wa fi ba'din nusakh hasanun sahih. And translation of this hadith. Abu Dhar, Jundub bin Junada in Abu Abdul Rahman, Mu'ad bin Jabal, Radu Anhuma reported the Messenger Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Have taqwa of Allah wherever you may be and follow up an evil deed with a good one, which will wipe it out and behave with people in excellent character. A Tirmidhi relates that it is a Hassan tradition. In some copies, he says it is Hassan and Sahih Hadith. Okay. As is our tradition, we're going to now go into the lives of the narrators of this Hadith. Okay. And the first narrator here is Abu Dar al Gifari. Jundub bin Junada is another one of his names. And Abu Dar al Gifari al Kinani, also known as again Jundub bin Junada. He was perhaps the fifth or the sixth person to convert to Islam according to the famous historian at tabari And of course he was from Al-Muhajirun, okay, the immigrants. Okay. So he was the first of the Muslimun. Okay. He actually belonged to the tribe of Banu Ghifar. And they were basically famous for being highway robbers. And this actually amazed the Prophet ﷺ when he took the shahada when he declared the allegiance to Prophet ﷺ and declaring his shahada that just amazed Muhammad ﷺ because his tribe was known to be evil, evil doers in terms of being highway robbers. And it's interesting the contrast between his tribe and him, this great Sahabi. Okay. And he was famous, he was perhaps most famous for being one of the most outspoken critics of luxury and worldly temptations to the point where it actually caused him it caused him to live in isolation during the latter years of his life he as we mentioned was born to the Ghifar clan which was found in the western south of Medina Munawwara okay. and when he heard the contention that a new prophet had arisen in Makkah Abu Dhar and his brother traveled to Makkah to find this prophet and there's a beautiful story actually about Abu Dar and his conversion as well. When he found Ali Wadi'an. It's a long story, but it's something which inshallah you should look more into. Again, this is, these are just superficial aspects and pointers from the life of this great Sahabi. But go further inshallah and learn more about these great Sahaba who were the students of the Messenger of Allah And they really personified whatever the Prophet taught them. So, Abu Dhar, um, he was told by the to, he was told to the Prophet Sallam, and his story is narrated in Sahih Bukhari. He was told he said to Abu Dhar, "O oh Abu Dhar, keep your conversion as a secret and return to your town. And when you hear of our victory, return to us." What did Abu Dhar say? 
He said, By him who has sent you with the truth, I will announce my conversion to Islam publicly amongst them. Ya'ni the Quraysh. Ya'ni these idolaters. Okay. So he went to the Kaaba, where some people from the Quraysh were present and said, O folk of the Quraysh, okay. Ya Quraysh, I testify that Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. I testify that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah. And I also testify that Muhammad is Allah's slave and messenger. And hearing that the Quraysh said, Get at this Sabi, which the Muslims were labeled as, you know, Sabi, the religion of being a Sabian, is what the Muslims were called. They got him and beat him nearly to death. He relates this story. Okay, hearing that the Qurayshi men said, Get at the Sabi, they got up and beat me nearly to death. Al Abbas saw me and threw himself over me to protect me. Okay. Of course, at that time, Al Abbas was not a Muslim. Okay. He accepted after Makkah was conquered. Okay. He then faced them and said, Woe to you, this is Al Abbas. You want to kill a man from the tribe of Ghifar, although your trade and your communications are through the territory of Ghifar? They therefore left me. Next morning I returned to the masjid, returned to the Kaaba, and I said the same as I have said on this previous day. They said again, get at this sabi. I was treated the same way as on the previous day, and again Al Abbas found me and threw himself over me to protect me and told them the same as he had said the day before. Okay. So was the conversion of Abu Dhar al Ghafari anhu to Islam. Beautiful story again. And look at the determination of Abu Dhar. No fear. When he accepted the Islam, he was just full, 100% there. Similar to Umar bin Khattab, similar to Hamza, alhamdulillah. But this was even before their conversion. And this is really just a reflection of the beautiful merits of Abu Dhar al khifar As the Prophet said, he said, when you hear of our victory, return to us. And did he return? Okay. After the Hijrah, Abu Dhar al ghifari Radhan, he joined Muhammad Sallallahu in Medina and he literally returned with hundreds of people. This is the da'wah that he gave to his people. Look how diligent he was during those several years. The Muhammad Sallallahu is also is reported to have said, and this is narrated in Tirmidhi, he said, Neither has the sky shaded one more truthful and honest than Abu Dhar, nor has the earth had anyone walk over it like him in these matters. He is like Isa bin Maryam. This is a Hassan hadith as well. And during the battle of Tabuk, Abu Dhar was left behind because his camel was very ill or very weak. Okay. So he basically delayed. He was the, uh, all the way in the back of the army when they were going towards Tabuk. Okay. And so he, seeing that his camel, his man was so weak and just so behind, so he saw that there was such a big gap between him and the Muslimun. He basically left it. You know, he left his ride. I mean, this was a barren desert, miles and miles. Just to go alone and carry your belongings, that's just something where just, you're going to leave yourself vulnerable. But this is what he did. So he placed the, the pack on his back, walked to the rest of the army. Muhammad Sallallahu saw him and exclaimed, May Allah have mercy on Abu Dhar. He said then, he spends his life all alone. Death will single him out. And on the day of judgment, he will stand up all alone. And this prediction actually did occur, which the Prophet ﷺ mentioned regarding Abu Dhar. He died in 652 Christian era at Rabada. This is basically an area outside of Medina, east of Medina. And Abu Dhar, he is remembered for his strict piety, his life of Zod at rejecting the luxuries of the world. And he also died in that simple state when he was with the Messenger of Allah Wasallam when he was alive. And he passed away with his devoted wife along by his side, Wadu'an. And the other narrator, which we're going to as well, is none other than another great giant, which is Abu Abdul Rahman Mu'ad bin Jabal, Wadu'an. And he became actually Muslim at the hands of Musab bin Umair, great Sahabi, so many Muslims he 
brought to Islam, subhanAllah. The best certificate that Mu'ad bin Jabal could have received came from the Prophet ﷺ when he said, the most knowledgeable of my ummah in the matters of halal and haram is Mu'ad bin Jabal. And this is a sahih hadith. The greatest of Mu'ad bin Jabal's contributions to the ummah was that he was one of the group of six who collected the Qur'an during the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. And recall the hadith also regarding the Qur'an you know, take the Qur'an from four. One of them was also Mu'ad bin Jabal. And the Prophet ﷺ also placed Mu'ad bin Jabal in charge of teaching Islam to new Muslims. He actually, Wasallam, asked him and quizzed him about how he would teach the people. He, Wasallam then put the following question to Mu'ad, according to what will you judge? And Mu'ad an said, According to the book of Allah. And then he saw some said, And if you find nothing therein, he said, According to the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. Okay. And if you find nothing therein, then Muad said, I will exert myself, yani ijtihad, to form my own judgment. The Prophet ﷺ was so pleased with his reply. He said, Alhamdulillah, all praises to Allah, the one who has guided the Messenger of the Prophet to that which pleases the Prophet. Okay. And this narration does have some weakness in it, but it is reported by Ibn Kathir and also Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, the great Hadith scholar as well. So, going further regarding the life of this great Sahabi, Mu'ad bin Jabal, Radian, Ibn Mas'ud described him as an Ummah, a leader having all the good and righteous qualities, obedience, subservient, to Allah and also being Hanifa, the one who worshipped none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn Mas'ud, he said, we used to liken him to Ibrahim alayhi salam, yani Mu'ad bin Jabal. SubhanAllah, what a great description. Umar adi'an, thereupon, also summoned five people who had collected the Quran during the lifetime of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And they were none other than, of course, Mu'ad bin Jabal radi'an. Also, Ubadah ibn Asamith, Abu Ayyub al Ansari, Ubay bin Kaab, and Abu Darda. He said to them, Your brothers of Syria have asked me to help them in sending those who can teach them the Quran and instruct them in their religion. And so, thus, Mu'ad bin Jabal, he went to Palestine. And there, Mu'ad fell ill with some contagion, some infectious disease. And as he was near his death, he turned into the direction of Kaaba and repeated repeated his dua or chant, welcome death, welcome. A visitor has come after a long absence and looking up to the heaven he said, Ya Rabb, O Lord, you know that I did not desire the world and to prolong my stay in it. O Lord, accept my soul with goodness as you would accept a believing soul. He then, Mu'ad bin Jabradan, passed away far from his family and his clan, a Dai in the service of Allah and a Muhajirist path at the age of only 33 years of age. Again, may Allah allow us to benefit and give tawfiq from the lives of the Sahaba of the Prophet Wasallam, such as Abu Dhar and Mu'ad bin Jabbar. Very inspirational story, subhanAllah. So now the muqaddim of this hadith which is on taqwa. And this is a very important term which all Muslims need to know. This is an essential term. And it's mentioned repeatedly in the Qur'an al-Kareem and also in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's something we need to have in our lives day in and day out. Okay? As much as possible. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, اِتَّقُلَّهَ or فَتَّقُلَّهَ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ have taqwa of Allah as much as you can. Okay, so this is something which we have to. And we're going to look at taqwa altogether. And because it's a multifaceted word, just like ihsan, just like Islam, just like iman, it's a very multi-dimension, multifaceted, a dynamic word which we can't just put a English definition, whether it's awareness of Allah, whether it's fear of Allah, those things are not appropriate because it encompasses so much more. So let's look at the Arabic 
base or the root and taqwa is actually derived from waqa okay or waqaya which means to protect waqa yaqi that's the root verb okay and with regards to allah azawajal it means to in general keep between oneself and the punishment and wrath of allah okay so you keep a protection between yourself and the punishment or whatever causes you to displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that protection really is tawheed and all of mankind, insan, are ordered to fulfill that. And actually the first command to mankind, the first command in the Qur'an is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Baqarah, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ عَبُدُوا رَبَّكُمُ الَّذِي خَلَهَكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّكُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O mankind, worship Allah, the one who created you and the ones before you, so that you may have taqwa, have the awareness of Allah. But well, this is basically the, the result of ubudiyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So thus the translation of taqwa, to fear Allah, is one aspect of this comprehensive topic. Okay. Ali ibn Abi Talib an, defined taqwa as fearing Allah adhering to his commandments, being content with what he provides one with, and getting ready for Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the Day of Judgment. And Muhammad Asad, the one who wrote the famous translation of the Qur'an in English, he translates taqwa to be, to be conscious of Allah, Azza wa Jal. Others translate taqwa as piety, since taqwa is such a dynamic and comprehensive term, it is again, as we mentioned, better just to use the word as is without translating it. Okay. So taqwa, or for example, fearing Allah, okay, in this respect, according to the early ulama or scholars, the minimal level of fearing Allah is to fulfill the obligations and keeping away from the prohibitions. According to Imam Ibn Rajab, rahimahullah, and other scholars, taqwa is the fulfilling of obligations and avoidance of prohibitions and doubtful matters. It is the advice of Allah and His prophets to all mankind. That is to have taqwa of Allah. And of course, Muhammad Wasallam used to frequently advise and remind his companions about taqwa in his talks on many different occasions. Okay, so many different ahadith. And again, we'll see again and again and again in the Quran Kareem, taqwa is mentioned left and right. Personally, actually, I look at taqwa as like a sixth sense. Just like how you would be careful around a hot stove. Thus, this increased awareness. It's almost like, you could say, a spidey sense. I mean, if you, not that I encourage you to watch Spider-Man. I'm not too familiar with it. But I know that much that, for example, this character, Spider-Man, whenever there's something dangerous going on, he has this extra sense. It's like a spidey sense. Similarly, this extra sixth sense this is what taqwa is. So you're extra conscious so that you protect yourself from evils. You protect yourselves from anything which leads to the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, anything which leads you one step more closer to the greatest abomination which is jahannam. When a'udhu billah. Okay. So this is the sixth sense that, that something evil is lurking and this occurs when you want to protect yourself from sin. And you are aware also that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there and watching you. And so you are not swayed to be unaware in this secular world. And this is why it's so important to have taqwa. Because without taqwa, our ibadat will be without meaning. Our salawat are just, we won't be aware of what we have recited. We lose the whole essence of what taqwa is. Okay. So taqwa keeps the, the fuel going. Okay, keeps our blood flowing with iman, inshallah. All these different meanings of taqwa, whether it's uh, to be aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to have tawheed, that sixth sense, all that goes in. And really, it's something we have to strive for. It's not just something which is just comes automatically. We have to you know, put the extra effort to have taqwa. Okay, and that's why the muhsinun, the ones who have excellence, they are the ones who have the highest level, they are the ones who have the highest taqwa as well. Because day in and day out, they exert the most in their ibadat, in their actions, and always take it to the higher level. 
Okay, because they put effort into what they're doing. Again, taqwa requires effort, inshallah. Okay. So here when Rasulullah said, Ittaqillah kunt. Have taqwa of Allah wherever you are. Okay. This just is a great way to protect yourself from anything which may lurk at you and come at you from different angles. Anything which shaitan tries to throw at you, you're ready. Anything which the brethren of the shayateen come at you with, you're ready, inshallah. So, continuing, where the Prophet says, Okay, So, have taqwa at any time and any place. This is where, Haytuma kunt. Haytuma, at any time and any place. Always ready. 24-7. And as we mentioned before, numerous times is taqwa mentioned in the Quran Kareem and also in the Ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ. So, for example, in Ali Imran, Surah Ali Imran, ayah number 102, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqu Allah haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimoon. O believers have taqwa of Allah as it is His right to have taqwa and do not die except as Muslims. So here, taqwa is a foundation of this deen, it is an obligation. As much as it is his right, have taqwa. Haytuma kunt, mastata'tum, as much as possible. So this type of taqwa is actually, you can say, defined as acting in accordance with the obedience or to the obedience of Allah. Okay. Upon the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the Quran, and also to abandon sins from that light that He has given us. So in other words, you carry out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commands and avoid His prohibitions. And this is again just building on that notion of commandments and prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to honor them and to guard them. Okay, and this is what, again, one important meaning of taqwa is. Okay. And the highest type of taqwa is to leave anything which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't like. So for example, the makruhat, Right? Something which is not liked or favored. So the muhsin avoids that and that's the highest level because it's not haram per se, but it's something which may push someone towards the haram matters if they indulge in the makruhat too frequently. The true muttaqi, he's abstained from that too. And similarly, the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu attaqullaha haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. So how can you have taqwa of Allah as it is his right to have taqwa? And the best response to this is in the action of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is when he sallallahu alaihi wasallam was asked by his beloved wife Aisha. She said to him, "O oh, Prophet of Allah, why do you undergo so much hardship despite the fact that Allah has pardoned for you earlier and later sins? He وسلم, said, Afala akunu abdan shakura? He said, Should I not prove myself to be a thankful servant? And this is mutafaqqan alay. Okay. Beautiful response. Because this is Allah subhanahu wa haq that I do as much as possible. And this is what the Prophet did. He exceeded that to the point where his ankles will swell up. That's how much time he spent in the, the prayer. Ya amanu okay. This is taqwa. This is the exemplification of the highest level of taqwa. Continuing on the importance of taqwa. So by the realization of taqwa, a Muslim is granted many bounties and blessings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Talaq, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَل لَّهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبُ And whoever fears Allah, He will make for him a way out. And He will provide for him from where he does not expect. Okay, beautiful ayah or ayat. Okay. So, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَل لَّهُ مَخْرَجًا He will make a way out for him. Not only that, and He will provide for him from where he does not expect. Again, other benefits of taqwa. Not only that, taqwa also eases 
the difficulty from one's matters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again says in Surah Talaq, He says later on, as you recite or read this beautiful surah, He says, And whoever fears Allah, He will make for him of his matter ease. يَجْعَلَّهُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِ يُسْرًا This is for the one who has taqwa. You are aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have this iman, right? You're doing this and you have the sabr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make that matter easy for you. And this ayah actually reminds me of a story of one friend of ours. Their son had a bad case of thalassemia. And very young, I mean, Every couple of weeks, transfusion after transfusion. I mean, his hemoglobin was so low, his blood count was so low, that he had to just repeatedly get transfusions. I mean, think of this three, four year old going to the hospital endlessly, you know, just being poked and having blood transfused week in and week out. And so, and I mentioned the sayah, And the brother, he continued, and he said, وَمَن يَتَّكِ اللَّهَ يَجَلَّهُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِ يُسْرًا So he followed my ayah with this ayah from Surah Talaq. And subhanAllah, look at the generosity and the awesomeness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you have taqwa of Allah, and you place your trust in Allah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala eases that significant difficulty. And subhanAllah, now the same child, he doesn't have to have blood transfusion anymore. Because alhamdulillah, he got a donor, he got a match. He was endowed with a bone marrow transplant, and alhamdulillah, now he is cured from his thalassemia to the point where he doesn't need to have weekly or bi-weekly transfusions. Subhanallah. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who, the one who has taqwa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, makes the matter easy. وَيَجَلَّهُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِ يُسْرًا okay. And now in that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also, He also removes sins from the one who has taqwa. Again, going further in Surah Talaq, and whoever fears Allah, He will remove for him his misdeeds. Now with that, and make great for him. His ajr. Subhanallah. This is taqwa. And this is the surah which mentions taqwa the most. Surah Talaq. Okay, know this and memorize this surah. Beautiful. Surah for you to memorize. Okay. And continuing. Now with that, taqwa, another benefit of taqwa is to be able to distinguish between the right and the wrong. And it allows us also to obtain guidance and help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to acquire beneficial knowledge. And perhaps the greatest benefit of the one who has taqwa is gaining also the hub of Allah, the love of Allah. Because remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and in response to the Fatiha, He says, Alif Lam Mim Thalika Al-Kitab La Raiba Fi Hudan Lil Muttaqeen Alif Lam Mim This is the book of Allah and there's no doubt about it. Hudan Lil Muttaqeen It is guidance for who? For the the one who has knowledge? Is it the one who does a lot of deeds? No. It is the one who has taqwa. So you can have a lot of knowledge. You can even do a lot of good deeds. But that may even not be fruitful. But you have to have taqwa. have to have the awareness of Allah infused in it to be able to what? Have guidance. And that's the goal. That's why we're even here, right? We're trying to gain tools of guidance so we can not be strayed from the path, from the goal of, inshallah, Jannah. This is what, again, taqwa does. Going forward, taqwa and sins. And then, Rasulullah says, وَأَتْبِ إِسَّيِّئَةَ الْحَسَنَةَ تَبْخُوهَا Beautiful. Following taqwa, and then follow up the evil deed with a hasana. A sayyi'ah is an evil deed. It is the opposite of hasana. Okay. And there's other terms also for sayyi'ah, such as dhamb, okay, sin, okay, or sharr. Okay. So hasana is, you equalize it and even elevate yourself more. It wipes it out. 
tabahuha. They have to also realize that taqwa does not imply perfection. Those who have taqwa are still subject to committing sins. However, if they do so, okay, that continuous state of taqwa, they will repent right away. Again, reflex. Okay, it's a reflex. They repent right away and follow up that bad deed with a good deed in order to wipe it out, as mentioned in this hadith. Thus, the one with taqwa will have the reflex to repent and also perform the good deed if he slips into a sin. Because again, it's human nature to, to slip. Like our father Adam a.s. Where the Prophet says, Each of the children of Adam is a khatta, makes you know, mistakes. And the best of those who are khatta, the ones who make errors or sins, are the tawabun, the ones who repent. And we have to be the tawabun. This hadith is authenticated by Sheikh Al-Bani. Rahimullah. Going forward, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is our Rahman. And He has left the door of forgiveness open by so many different means so that sin can be blotted out. So to follow up a bad deed with a good deed, you know, as in this hadith, it's also echoed in Surah Hud also in Ayah 114 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الْحَسَنَاتِ يُدْحِبُنَ السَّيِّئَاتِ ذَلِكَ ذِكْرَ لِلْذَّاكِرِينَ Verily, the good deeds remove the evil deeds. That is a reminder for those who remember. So, in al hasanat yudhibinas sayyat. Okay. Going further. Okay. It also shows that a believer should do istighfar for his sins and also exert effort to wipe out the bad deeds. By also again. Remember we talked about hasanat, good deeds. Good deeds, doing good deeds only increases you. Okay? It removes your misconceptions. It makes open the path for ilm. It increases your iman. It's just so much good that it does. But avoiding the good deeds, it just throws you backwards. Okay? So one more great benefit of amal aswali, to do good deeds, is to wipe out the sayyat, the evil deeds. Okay. So the worse a sin gets, the greater the good deed has to be also to wipe out that sin. Sometimes you may not even realize if we did a sin. So this is why we also always should be frequent in our good actions, inshallah, and also in our istighfar and our tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we are imperfect and we are very forgetful as well. And the shaitan also increases in that forgetfulness and the error and the slippage as well as human beings. So we should, again, uh, rely on the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be frequent in good deeds and increasing and amplifying our taqwa insha'Allah. And there are other ways that uh, by which sins are forgiven as stated in the Quran and the Sunnah as well, the Hadith of the Prophet sallallahu We have istighfar, you know, seeking the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by dua. Okay, we should seek istighfar frequently. I mean, there's some narrations where the Prophet used to do istighfar hundred times or the like. Tawbah again is essential for any major sin. Any sin you do, anything major, it requires Tawbah. Sincere repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, big kabair is not just uh, neutralized by good deed. Uh, so we have to also remember that as well. So, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has always left the door open except for when we're in the grave. So we have to uh, strive to Equalize our sayyat with tawbah and istighfar and good deeds. And the dua, of course, of Muslims for one another, always do dua for others as well. Performing the daily salawat as well. It, of course, erases all the smaller deeds between them. Of course, we rely on the mercy and the forgiveness of Allah, always invoking the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ighfirli. Forgive me. Allah maghfir lana dhunubana wa kaffirna sayyatina wa tawaffana ma'ala abra. Dua like this, we should recite frequently as well. Afflictions and calamities is also one other way where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wipes out our bad deeds as well. Okay, so just have to be patient and those things will actually, alhamdulillah, make it easy when we stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
the torment of the grave, of, of course, uh, and we seek Allah's refuge, but this is still better for the sinning believer than going into Jahannam as well. So these are actually means by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cleanses the sins from people. The horrible scenes and events of the last day also, and the shafa by the Prophet on the Day of Judgment, and also the shafa of pious Muslims on the Day of Judgment as well. Okay. But we have to do our part, of course, to follow in the footsteps of the Prophet because we want him to recognize us as of those who followed his sunnah, so that he can, inshallah, uh, intercede on our behalf when we need intercession. Going forward, the consequence of our deeds. So whenever we perform a good deed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards us by guiding us to another good deed. One good deed leads to another. On the other hand, doing a bad deed without regret, without istighfar, without opposing it with a good deed, will result in the opposite, another bad deed. So we cannot go into a bad streak. It could be a slippery slope. So it needs to be opposed by repentance and also doing a good deed and avoiding that pathway to repeating the sayyah. Not only that, but repeatedly doing bad deeds can cause the person to become a sinner, a fajr, a mujrim. We do not want to be a criminal in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when the performance of bad deeds becomes the norm, the heart gets diseased, a lot of black spots, and it can sometimes even become sealed. And when it becomes sealed, then that's basically it. You know, that's going to be like a point of no return. And may Allah protect us, because that often is a state of kufr or nifaq, hypocrisy. So there is an end point for bad deeds, and that's what it is. The hard, sealed heart. Okay, that's what we have to prevent because then it's a point of no return. May Allah protect us. So going forward, fruits of taqwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ جَنَّةٍ نَعِيمٍ Indeed, for the muttaqeen, the one who have taqwa, is with their Lord, okay, jannah, or gardens, which are na'im, blissful gardens. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُتَّقِينَ Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He loves the muttaqin, the one who has taqwa, He loves them. Okay, may Allah, Allah majalla مِنَ الْمُتَّقِينَ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ أَرُضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرُضُ عِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ one of my favorite ayahs of the Quran Kareem where Allah subhanahu says, Wasariu, He commands us, race to the forgiveness of your Lord. And which is what? Which is a jannah, which is a garden. Ardu has samawatu wal ard. Ard is its width, not its length. Its smaller dimension is the size of the heavens and the earth. Widdat lil muttaqeen. Allah subhanahu is giving us some dimensions of our real estate, or our promised real estate in the Akhirah. How can we realize the, the expanse of Jannah? And one thing you would like to know about a house in general is what? Is its size? You know, we know its location, but what about its size? How big is it? So Allah subhanahu is telling us the size of our real estate. And here Allah subhanahu is saying, it is, its width is the size of the heavens and the earth. So what's the heavens of the earth? And if you pair this ayah with another ayah from Surah Safat, where Allah subhanahu wa says, Inna zayyanna sama dunya bizina til kawakib. So here Allah subhanahu wa says, Indeed we have adorned the lowest heavens, yani as-sama dunya bizina til kawakib, with the adornment of the stars. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying the lowest heavens are decorated with the stars. Okay. And if you look at, for example, the lowest heavens, yani this universe, this is basically decorated with kawakib, with the stars. Kawakib is star. That's a classical definition of kawakib. Kawakib is the plural. And these are the stars. And how many stars do we have? I mean, there's literally, there's billions and billions of stars to the point where we're in the Milky Way galaxy. And 
the distance of the universe is not in miles, but is in light years. You know, if you look at the distance, it's just, I mean, it is just something which uh, will make you dizzy. I mean, the uh, we haven't even gone to the uh, the extent or not the edges of the universe, subhanAllah. And this is the lowest heavens. Billions and billions of light years. This is the lowest heavens. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Ardu has samawatu wal ard. Its width is the size of the heavens and the earth. And from another uh, hadith regarding Ayatul Kursi, the comparison of the Kursi to the heavens is like a is like a ring in a desert. The point is, it is just exponential. It cannot be measured. This is what we're given. Really, an infinite, infinite landscape. We can't even calculate it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you basically blank check. Just a blank check. It's like when he says in Surah Qaf, وَلَهُمْ مَا يَشَاءُونَ فِيهَا وَلَدَيْنَا مَزِيدٌ And for them is whatever they desire. وَلَهُمْ مَا يَشَاءُونَ فِيهَا And from us is more. SubhanAllah, this is generosity. If we're stuck to the limitations of dunya, if we're going to be stuck there, then it's going to be impossible to reach our destination upstairs. Upstairs, limitless. Downstairs, is just basically a pit waiting for us. Waladaina mazid. And from him, even more. So you want whatever you want, it's there. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will even give you more because we can't even contemplate what's best for ourselves. Subhanallah. This is for the muttaqin, lil muttaqin. Weddat lil muttaqin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared this for the muttaqin. So this is why we're doing what we're doing. Allahumma jalla min al muttaqin. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Jannatu ad yadhulunaha tajri min tahtiha al anaharu lahum fiha ma yashauna kadalik. كَذَلِكَ يَجْزِ اللَّهُ الْمُتَّقِينَ Gardens of Eden. They will enter it where you have gardens under which rivers flow. They will have in whatever they want. مَا يَشَعُونَ Like that, this is how we reward the ones who have taqwa. كَذَلِكَ يَجْزِ اللَّهُ الْمُتَّقِينَ So we can go on and on about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes care of the muttaqeen. And really, this is the highest of stations and mindsets. Allahumma jalla min al-muttaqeen. Then Rasul sallam goes further. Then he says, وَخَالِقِ النَّاسَ بِخُلُقٍ حَسَنٍ And this is also another beautiful avenue to having taqwa. Because Ibn Rajab says, having good character is a characteristic of taqwa. So it is an obligation for every Muslim to treat others well and to deal and interact with them in a good manner. Because Rasulullah says, khalik nas and it's a command, and treat the people with the best of character. Okay? Not the worst of character, not with violence. And unfortunately, this is the portrayal of the Muslim, the typical average Muslim, right? From the non-Muslim Fox 5 eyes. So Ibn Rajab says in his commentary, good character is a characteristic of taqwa. Okay. And we also said in terms of being muhsin, ihsan, if you look at Surah Yusuf, كَذَلِكَ يَجْزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ And again and again, Yusuf Islam exemplified ihsan. How? Was it through worship of Allah like he saw Allah or like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saw him? No, even though he definitely did it by in that realm. However, it was through his character, dealing with people who betrayed him, who treated him in the worst way. He replied, that behavior with ihsan. That was ihsan. So thus, taqwa is incomplete without excellent or good character. And this is the last thing mentioned, this hadith. Many Muslims erroneously think that taqwa implies fulfilling the rights of Allah without the need to fulfill the rights of others. Remember, the vertical and the horizontal relationship. You can never forget the vertical relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also 
do not let the horizontal relationship mess us up because it will cause us to be bankrupt on Yom Qiyamah. Remember, if you mess up those links and transgress others, it's much more easier to ask Allah subhanahu wa for forgiveness than the other people. Because they're not as merciful as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why excellent character is essential, particularly in this time and age where the Sunnah of the Prophet, the exemplar character, is really not seen much in the Muslim Ummah, particularly even in you know the most seemingly holy places or the holy destinations such as Makkah Madina, even then unfortunately we don't see much of you know Ahsan or good character, Khuluq and Hassan. But we have to revive that as an Ummah. If that's not revived, then this is basically our fabric. Our fabric is excellent character. This is how Islam got into the hearts of the people. Part of hadith number 27 from the collection of Arba'een is the following, where the Prophet says, Al-Birru Khusunul Khuluq. Okay. Righteousness is good character, which is also mentioned in Sahih Muslim, okay. this hadith. So, again, good character, righteousness, it's together. Okay. Another hadith by Abu Huraira, who said, أَكْمَلُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِيمَانًا أَحْسَنُهُمْ خُلُقًا وَخِيَارُكُمْ خِيَارُكُمْ لِنِسَائِهِمْ خُلُقًا The most complete of the believers in faith is the one with the best character among them. Okay. أَحْسَنُهُمْ خُلُقًا okay. أَحْسَنُهُمْ خُلُقًا وَخِيَارُكُمْ خِيَارُ لِنِسَائِهِمْ خُلُقًا And the best of you are those who are best to your women. And this is narrated by Abu Huraira, and it's in the book of Jami At-Tirmidhi and Greater Hassan by Abu Isa, which is another name for Imam At-Tirmidhi, rahimallah. And we said that Imam At-Tirmidhi, he was a student of Imam Bukhari, and when he grades a hadith, it is done. It's a done deal. It is Hassan. If he says it's Hassan, it's Hassan. Abu Darda, wadi'an, narrated the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, ما من شيء يدع في الميزان أتقال من خصن الخلق وإن صاحب خصن الخلق لا يبلغ به درجة صاحب الصوم والصلاة. أبو دردا narrates that the Prophet said nothing is placed on the scale that is heavier than good character. Okay, أثقل من الخصن الخلق. Nothing. Indeed, the person with good character will have attained the ranks or the rank of the person of fasting and prayer. Jami at tirmidhi great as Sahih. Just need good character. You, know, you don't have to do long ibadat to attain great hasanat. Okay? And it's unfortunately so difficult to do because we just have to clean our hearts. And that's the power of a clean and sincere and loving heart. It's so hard to have, right? This is what you find in people who have excellent character. The Prophet وسلم, also has made iman and good character as the main criteria for which a woman accepts a man's proposal. Okay. Abu Huraira narrates that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, When someone whose religion and character you are pleased with proposes to one of you, okay, then marry her to him. And if you do not do so, then there will be fitna in the land and fasad, corruption. And this is Hassan, and it's also found in Jami at Tirmidhi. So beautiful hadith, beautiful admonitions from and advices and encouragement from the hadith of Prophet from numerous Quranic ayahs, just a few which we've gone through, which go on topic of taqwa. I mean, look at Surah Talaq, Surah Baqarah. I mean, again and again and again, recurring topic: Ittaqillah, Ittaqillah, Haytu Makunt. I mean, again and again, a very important concept we need to understand and apply as much as possible so that we can, inshallah, reserve that promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala above, inshallah. Okay. So, highlights of this beautiful hadith. Okay, so taqwa is an essential quality of a believer which is echoed numerous times in the Quran Kareem and the hadith of the Prophet It is the awareness of Allah of Jal, adhering to His commandments and staying away from His prohibitions. Again, that sixth sense that to avoid the danger of sin 
and anything which leads us to the pit. And a Muslim in green with taqwa is careful of his actions and reflexively performs good deeds. And even when he slips into sin, he immediately responds by doing tawba, repenting, or by doing a good deed, as this hadith encourages us to do. Furthermore, he deals with people with khuluq and hasan, with the excellent character as commanded by Rasulullah sallallahu Altogether, taqwa involves a continual awareness and connection with our Creator while exemplifying good character with the creation. Again, optimizing the vertical and also the horizontal relationship. Okay. And some questions again, just to go over these great concepts and learn regarding taqwa, inshaAllah ta'ala. And jazakallah khairan again for your attendance. And may Allah again give us tawfiq. Alhamdulillah min al-muttaqeen. Uh, may Allah allow us to fully benefit from what we have heard and seen in this great hadith and also the other numerous admonitions from the Quran and the, and the hadith of the Prophet. Subhanaka Allahu hamdik wa nashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta wa as-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.